So good morning to all and, and, and welcome to this virtual policy forum on reconciling the protection of civilians and host state support in UN peacekeeping. This event is co-hosted by IPI and the permanent mission of the Kingdom of Netherlands to the United Nations. My name is Nami Diradza. I am a senior fellow at IPI's Brian Urquhart Center for Peace Operations and the head of IPI's Protection of Civilians program. IPI's POC program aims at informing policy development and practice related to the protection of civilians in peacekeeping context. And we seek to support member states, the UN Secretariat and peace operations in the efforts to enhance the delivery of protection mandates in the field. In particular, the specific objectives of the project are to clarify roles and responsibilities of the different actors involved in the implementation of protection, to connect political and protection strategies, and to enhance accountability for the protection of civilians. In this framework, we are glad to launch our latest report today. The policy paper was authored by my colleague, Dr. Patrick Labuda, and is entitled with or against the state, reconciling the protection of civilians and host state support in UN peacekeeping. I would like to thank the Netherlands for the support to the paper and for their support to IPI's POC program. And I invite His Excellency Ambassador Karel van Oosterham, permanent representative of the Netherlands to the UN for opening remarks. Karel, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Nami. Thank you so much. Thank you, well, Nami. I think we agree we have to do this in English, although I would have preferred Dutch or French. Um, Nami, I'm really wondering whether IPI is the institute which profits the most from the current COVID-19 crisis, because on the one hand, it seems you organize twice as many events at IPI, and secondly, you have twice as many participants, because somehow the threshold is quite low to just join these wonderful meetings you're having at IPI. And I think if I look at my schedule in the past couple of weeks, every day almost I was an IPI event. So uh, I think uh, COVID-19 serves to reinforce the reputation of uh, IPI as a thought leader on many issues uh, related to the UN and certainly when it comes to peacekeeping operations and protection of civilians. I just would like to commend you personally, but it's also, also your institute for everything you're doing. And I'm very happy that also today we see so many participants. Uh, we have an issue at hand, I think, which is, is of importance to all of us. Uh, and Patrick, I just mentioned uh, to you, congratulations to a report well written, well researched and very policy relevant for those of us uh, working and trying to make peacekeeping operations more effective. Um, I think you, your report is a, is a very important contribution. Uh, when I read your report, it struck me, um, I was in Cyprus like 25 years ago and I saw the peacekeeping mission in UNFISIP and that was classic peacekeeping with two state actors in the UN and a blue line in between and being a neutral buffer between two state parties and the whole concept of peace operations in the past 25-30 years has changed and I think your report puts the finger on the spot and that stabilization missions are really something completely different with a new environment, new threats, new challenges, but certainly also with a new rule, uh, role for the host government. Uh, and indeed, is it, um, is it with or against the government? I think uh, all of us would be our preference to work very closely with the government. It's very uh, difficult to work against, but sometimes there is, there's a friction between the two and I think your report was very enlightening on that one. Uh, for us, we uh, we love these kind of reports. That's why the, uh, my government paid for it because it adds to stabilization, to uh, peace, stability, um, and also to even to the more effective role of peacekeeping operations. For my government, international legal order, multilateralism, and effective UN is a, is a key part of a foreign policy. And your report will, no doubt contribute to more effective uh, peacekeeping operations and stabilization missions in the field. So it enhances our common knowledge, it enhances our common trust, it enhances our common cooperation, which is good, I think, for all of us. And uh, that's also, I come back to IPI, you're on my mind all the time. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this event. And by talking, having this conversation, I think we'll be strengthening international security and stability for the time to come. Merci beaucoup, dankjewel Nami. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you for your kind words. And I have to reiterate my uh, congratulations to Patrick. It, it, it's truly an in-depth report on a very important topic. Um, 
The UN is, after all, an organization of states uh, and support to host states represents a cornerstone of UN peacekeeping approaches. Um, and as UN peace operations are expected to implement ambitious protection of civilians mandates, they are also mandated to support the states that are hosting them. And they do so for different means, for capacity building, stabilization activities, support to the restoration and extension of state authority, and more generally for the support to peace processes. Uh, supporting host states is critical to ensure national ownership of protection strategies and the sustainability of, of protection activities that are undertaken by UN operations. The increased capacity and readiness of host governments to protect their own population is eventually key to reduce the need for UN peacekeepers to directly intervene and represents an essential benchmark to build exit strategies for peace operations. But I think it's important to, to mention that at the same time, where state actors such as national security forces are themselves responsible for violence against civilians, peacekeepers are also expected to confront government actors. And the Department of Peace Operations uh, on, uh, had issued a policy on protection of civilians that clearly defines protection of civilians as a duty and a priority that should be pursued regardless of the source of the threat. It means that UN peacekeepers have to protect civilians not only from armed groups, but from host state actors as well when necessary. And in these cases, as highlighted in the report we're presenting today, reconciling the imperatives of people-centered approaches and people-centered protection mandates with state-centric UN interventions can be a significant challenge. So the paper explores how UN peacekeeping operations protect civilians with, despite, or sometimes against the host state, and we have a, a, a very distinguished panel to, to discuss its main findings and recommendations. So I will turn to the panel. Uh, we have uh, today uh, Dr. Patrick Labuda, who is a non-resident fellow at the International Peace Institute and a postdoctoral scholar at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and the author of this policy paper. We also have Ms. Lisbeth Kuriti, uh, the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General uh, at the UN Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA. Uh, Lisbeth previously served in, in Haiti as the representative of OHCHR, uh, but also as the UN Resident Coordinator in Samoa, and most recently the Chief of Staff uh, with uh, MINUSMA, the UN mission in Mali. M Mr. Hugo Solinez is in charge of the DR Congo Integrated Operational Team in the Departments of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and Peace Operations, DPPA, DPO. He has previously served in a variety of functions in UN peacekeeping, including in the UN mission in, in the Congo, uh, but also in, in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations and the Executive Office of the Secretary General. Mr. Amar Mohamed Mahmoud is the Counselor of the Permanent Mission of Sudan to the United Nations, and he previously served in Kenya, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia. And finally, Ms. Aditi Goro is a senior fellow and the director of the Protecting Civilians in Conflict program at the Stimson Center. Her research focuses on uh, preventing and responding to violence against civilians, particularly in peacekeeping context. And she's the author of various reports, including a report on UN peacekeeping and host state consent. So I'm very happy to have all of you here. Our panelists' presentations will be followed by a QA session. So as they deliver the remarks, uh, I would like to invite you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you would like to add questions to our panelists. There will also be an opportunity to use the raise hand function during the Q&A to directly intervene via audio. But let me now turn to Patrick for a presentation of the main findings and recommendations of his report. So Patrick, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nami. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, I want to uh, begin by by thanking NAMI and uh, IPI for supporting this research and uh, arranging this event. Uh, thank you also to the three missions, uh, MINUSCA, MINUSCO, and UNMIS, um, who hosted me last summer, and of course to all the interviewees uh, whose ideas enriched uh, this report. So um, this report uh, really analyzes, I think, a core tension at the heart of modern uh, UN peacekeeping. And that is the tension between people-oriented uh, POC mandates and the state-centric logic of uh, UN-mandated interventions. Um, we all know that in the last 20 years, POC has become a priority for peacekeepers. 
it is in many ways, I think the, the raison d'etre of peacekeeping in countries like South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. At the same time, peacekeeping is by its very nature uh, dependent on host states. And uh, increasingly, missions are explicitly mandated to support host states. So the way I see it, we have two parallel phenomena. Uh, on the one hand, we have the rise of POC as a priority, and then we have also the rise of host state support. And by that, I mean the rise of, of mandates. There are more and more mandates that require peacekeepers to uh, support host states. And so this report is basically an attempt to, to see to what extent these two parallel phenomena are compatible or sometimes incompatible. Um, when does working with host states benefit civilians? Uh, when does empowering uh, state actors increase risks to civilians? And at what point, this of course is the most controversial question, at what point does a POC, ma POC mandate uh, uh, mean that the UN has to confront the host state, including by uh, using force? Uh, before I discuss sort of the bigger themes emerging from this research, I just want to touch very briefly um, upon the opportunities and challenges of marrying uh, POC with host state support. Um, in terms of opportunities, I think it's fairly clear that cooperating with host states uh, can have protection dividends uh, for civilians. And I think the report explains, for example, how awareness raising um, around sexual violence and child recruitment in some countries um, has contributed to a real mindset, uh, sorry, a, a real change in mindset. Uh, and the report uh, gives the example of, of um, the military and the DRC where regrettably there are still individual soldiers who commit rape but we don't see something that happened in the past, entire units going out and uh, raping civilians. Um, there are all, also other areas of cooperation, um, for example, rule of law reform, but here already I think we see both the opportunities and challenges of supporting um, uh, state actors. And so, for example, in MINUSCA and MINUSCO, um, these peace operations have supported domestic prosecutors to uh, bring cases against perpetrators of serious crimes. Uh, at the same time, we see, for example, in the DRC, that the mission cannot necessarily convince the same domestic prosecutors to bring cases against high level suspects. So suspects who have political connections, which in effect entrenches the impunity of government elites. So it's a bit of a paradox. Um, so the report essentially goes on to discuss a variety of challenges of, of this nature. Um, it, it talks about the implementation of the UN's human rights due diligence policy. Uh, the question here is to what extent can peacekeepers uh, support government actors who are considered a risk to civilians? Uh, it also discusses the problem of self-censorship in, in various missions. So when do peacekeepers, peacekeeping personnel, uh, tone down or suppress criticisms of uh, a host government's human rights record uh, to be able to maintain cooperation with that host state? And lastly, the report also talks about um, the, the most controversial question, of course, the use of force. Uh, when can peacekeepers use force against state actors? Um, and the problem here is, of course, that peacekeepers are dependent on host state consent. So by using force against the state, they are imperiling um, or potentially weakening, weakening the, the host state's consent. Um, so I think we can maybe come back to some of these uh, challenges and opportunities in the Q&A. But what I want to do in the few minutes that I have left um, is share with you what I think are uh, the, this report's uh, main takeaways. And then also talk briefly about COVID because I think uh, you know, this, this is a, a, an important problem and it's, it's changing how peace operations uh, 
how peacekeeping is being done. Uh, so first, I want to say that UN st staff really struggle uh, to agree on the relationship between POC and host state support. If nothing else, I think my interviews with UN officials across these three missions and in New York revealed very different understandings of why peacekeepers think they are deployed in the first place. And to oversimplify what is a very um, complex question, I'll just say that when you ask peacekeepers why they are, they are there, why they are operating in, in the host country, um, they reflect, reflexively and now effortlessly uh, invoke POC. It just rolls off the tongue naturally. Uh, we're here to protect civilians. But when you ask whether protection of civilians is something that should be done together with the host state, in support of the host state, uh, reactions vary considerably. And again, to oversimplify, there are those who think that at the end of the day, that the host state is the end game. Uh, everything a mission does, including POC, is just a means to an end. And that end is empowering the host state because the host state will one day have to take over the mission's protection responsibility. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are those who think, who view the host state with suspicion, caution, and even distrust. Um, I think, and I do want to emphasize that this divergence of opinion is doesn't just reflect the different mandates and operational realities, say, in, in UNMIS and MINUSCA. UNMIS does not have a, a mandate to support the host state. MINUSCA does. This divergence of opinion really cuts across missions, cuts across mission components, police, military, civilian, and it, it cuts across levels of peacekeeping personnel, so mid, low level, uh, high level staff. The second point I want to make is about people-oriented peacekeeping and state-centric support. I think for some time now, uh, people-centered peacekeeping has been a priority for the UN. And I think that generally speaking, peace operations are increasingly implementing various tasks that bypass host governments, or at least bypass formal state structures. And here we can mention MINUSCA's local peace agreements, uh, UNMIS's support for the South Sudanese National Dialogue, and then MINUSCA's elaborate set of POC mechanisms, community alert networks, um, early warning systems. And on the whole, this is a positive development, I think. But at the same time, I do think that we need to give more thought to um, the precise relationship between POC, people-oriented peacekeeping, and, and host state support. Um, sometimes I, I get the impression we think of this as people-centered peacekeeping in opposition to host state support as an alternative to supporting the host state. In reality, I think this is really about um, bottom-up people-centered initiatives that can complement uh, top-down state-centric initiatives. And here, I think there really is more scope for peace operations to, to partner um, with a, a wider range of actors, with the UN country team, bilateral donors, local and uh, international civil society, uh, to support what I call holistic capacity building, um, and which takes into account the needs of civilian populations, but also the needs of government institutions. And, Peace operations in general should leverage dialogue capacity building and its strength more proactively um, to induce um, best, best practices and also to promote really national ownership of POC compliant uh, initiatives. Lastly, uh, just very briefly, I want to touch upon, uh, as I mentioned, COVID. Of course, this report was written before COVID struck. Um, but I think it's important really to acknowledge uh, the, the fundamental shifts that are happening uh, that are just taking place around us. Uh, and I think, I think of COVID increasingly, uh, not so much as a rupture, but as an accelerator. Uh, even though everything around us has come to a standstill, uh, it is actually accelerating trends that have been simmering beneath the surface. And with respect to POC and host state support specifically, I think increasingly the dilemma for the UN is going to be um, what kind of states do they want to support? We see um, 
around us the rise of the security state, the rise of authoritarian forms of governance. And by this, I mean states that really have the capacity to monitor, control the lives of their citizens, to restrict personal freedoms. And the question for me is really, what does the rise of the security state these authoritarian forms of government, governance mean for peace operations in places like Sudan and the DRC? What will it mean to both support the host state and to protect civilians going forward? Um, so as we move away from robust multidimensional peacekeeping operations, I think the task actually of reconciling POC with host state support is likely to become qualitatively different, but even more challenging. So, okay, I've gone on for too long, so I'll stop there, but uh, um, thank you for your attention and uh, I look forward to the panelists' remarks. Thank you so much, Patrick. And, and I realize um, how, it's diffi how difficult it is to summarize a, such an incredibly comprehensive report that actually builds on so many examples from peacekeeping missions. Uh, but thank you for, for this summary. And I think uh, we have a lot to build on uh, with our panelists. Uh, so let me now maybe turn to uh, Lisbeth Coriti, the DSOSG of MINUSCA. Uh, Lisbeth, MINUSCA has been pursuing many initiatives in partnership with host state actors to maximize impact for the protection of civilians. So maybe building on Patrick's analysis uh, of the risks that can arise when working with host states, can you share your perspectives on the opportunities and challenges associated with this partnership and maybe your recommendations on the best way to connect protection and political strategies at, at the leadership level? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I couldn't agree more with, with much of what was said um, in, by the last speaker. Um, certainly when reading the report, um, I agreed with all of the, the major recommendations. Um, as you all know, uh, the Central African Republic is a country facing you know, deep political, religious, and ethnic divides. Um, it is a country which is um, challenged uh, by extremely uh, limited state presence and infrastructure. Uh, if we look at its history, um, the, 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 what, what's, what happened to this country uh, as a result of, of colonization, and the fact that to this day, we still have only 1,900 soldiers that are patrolling 623 square kilometers. Um, you can start to, to, to have a feeling for the, for the, for the challenges. So what we are facing in, in CAR today is still a, a territory which is largely uh, controlled by armed groups. Um, and we are now 16 months into a peace accord, which unfortunately has not become any more popular than it was the day it was adopted. Um, and this is indeed a, a very um, a, a great challenge for us. So I'd just like to say that um, MINUSCA has worked on a number of good practices that we continue and I think do have some, some very good um, results. Uh, of course, we are doing joint patrols uh, with the, the Central African uh, Security and Defense, Defense Forces. And we do those joint patrols with um, the forces that have been through the HRDDP uh, process. But I would like to add that I believe uh, through this experience and through previous experiences, um, HRDDP in and of itself, you know, faces great challenges because what we need to avoid is that uh, in and of itself, it becomes too much of a bureaucratic process. And this is important because we ultimately always feel more pressure to support the restoration of state authority, the deployment of state authority. In a country such as this, where there is very, very little state authority uh, out in the, in the countryside, it's important to at least begin to get people out there. So it's, it's a very uh, complex dilemma where I think at the end, and as the speaker has made reference, we, we as peacekeeping don't have the luxury of knowing we will be in place for a number of years and therefore feel pressured to, to deploy and to support the government to get uh, its people out on the ground. We also 
have an interesting um, way of doing our prison visits and monitoring human rights in which the army of the Central African Republic has a focal point that does go in and do the follow up if issues are found in the prisons. Um, with regard to the peace accord, some of the positive aspects is that we have put in place, and this is the first time out of CAR's recent seven peace processes that failed, that we put into place a complex monitoring mechanisms, me mechanism system, including local committees that look both from a technical perspective at security issues, but also from a political perspective, have a very representative and inclusive group of people who are meeting regularly to look at the implementation of the peace accord. So I think some of those are, are the, the, the good practices. Um, some of the other practices that were mentioned that we have made some headway with the judiciary. But again, that goes to the crux of the problem here. And that is that many of the armed groups are of Muslim. Um, they are, are Muslims and the central government is Christian. And so therefore there is more willingness to support arrests. So I think there we're, we're able to really see an example of the, 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 the ethnic uh, and religious and, and political divides here. Um, I want to talk about my favorite um, recommendation of the recommendations in the report, and that is something that was very much focused on by the last speaker, and it is the capacity building, people-centered uh, and holistic approach. I could not agree more, and that uh, comes from the bottom of my heart after 20 years in peacekeeping in Haiti and Sierra Leone and Mali, to know that if we focus only on the state, we will never ever reach our goal. So while I am a big promoter of supporting Inspection Générale de la Police, uh, Justice Militaire, and any monitoring mechanism that will help keep state authorities in check, I am also a big believer, even in a place such as CAR, to invest in working with the population through civil society groups, through religious groups, through traditional leaders, and so on and so forth. And I think even if we, and I can go quickly to say where we are today, we are choosing to probably take, uh, take more, uh, organize more military operations as we have become frustrated with the level of respect uh, of the armed groups in the implementation of the peace accord, we are becoming more active in arresting um, armed group leaders and members who take part in violations. Um, and we are um, working with government to take this harder stance. But I think even if we are in the process of taking a harder stance, we need to start working more with the local population. Um, I just want to take an example of what's been going on in, in the northeast of the country where we've had several massacres in, in the last months uh, in a place called Mendeli and uh, where the, in, an armed group um, has basically splintered and started fighting each other. But in the midst of this breakdown of this alliance, this loose alliance, uh, we have um, now been witnessing uh, an ethnic divide, which is quite serious and is expanding throughout the country. And this is a perfect of, uh, example of how we need to get out there and, and balance both those military operations and the arrests and the support to justice with working with the population, dialogue, uh, really engaging the population. And I think the government of Carr has made great efforts recently in the Northeast. But I want to maybe um, close by just saying we, we can't be everywhere uh, all, all the time. And we see um, corners of this country facing great challenges in, in many different areas, as I said, with ethnic divides, with the, the herder versus farmer uh, challenges, um, with, the, um, with, with class challenges, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this balance of investing in people who can develop watchdog groups, who can understand better how local governance operates, who can understand the parameters um, of, of, of what local budgets look like and understand how they can contribute to their society is very important. Uh, it is also important for the armed groups um, and the government to understand that that capacity is being built uh, so that we can avoid um, the kind of um, the violation and excessive use of power from either side. So I would say that um, 
We are very challenged here in CAR. Uh, the job is, is relentless, it is not easy, but the only way we will succeed is if we have this two-pronged approach um, with the author of this report has very much um, preached because go alone on the state building, uh, we will not have uh, the, the kind of uh, democratic principles that we seek taking root in this country. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisbeth. Uh, uh, thanks for this practical insight into a MINUSCA's engagement with the host government. And I think, I think this recommendation is extremely important, like to go beyond support to host states and also consider support to host communities and, and the civil societies uh, where, where, where peacekeepers are deployed, which in the end will also be the ones holding, account, holding their own state and their own government accountable for the protection of civilians once the mission departs. I, I believe, uh, Hugo, that was by the way, one of the uh, recommendations of a strategic review uh, of MONUSCO a few months ago, uh, really to have this shift and and, uh, and promote people-centered approaches. Um, so maybe if, if you can also share some views on, on the UN mission in the DR Congo, which also works closely with the host state for a, a large spectrum of joint protection activities, but also I think the mission for its history has uh, had to navigate complex host state dynamics and varying degrees of cooperation while pursuing its protection mandate. So could you walk us through the main lessons learned from MONUSCO and sure. examples of cooperation, or examples of dilemmas in this regard? Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Nami, and thanks to, to IPI for, for this opportunity to participate in, in a really important, I think, discussion for, for practitioners and and policymakers, and uh, I mean, like my like my predecessors, I'd like to congratulate uh, Patrick for a report that I really do think captures some of the dilemmas that we grapple with every day um, in the business. Um, and you know, before I get into some sort of practical examples, I just wanted to make a couple of, of general points in terms of the approach. I mean, first of all, I think the ambassador said this in the out at the outset: the fact that this issue is being um, looked at through the the lens of maintaining host nation consent, I think is very important because, you know, it's it's axiomatic that peacekeeping operations, even in their most sort of robust manifestation, as the ambassador rightly said, they've evolved considerably um, over the decades, and the use of force is very much now front and center. And I'd like to come back to that in a second. Um, peacekeeping remains at heart a consent based exercise, and it's extremely difficult to achieve any of our goals whether those that are related to strengthening host state capacity, extending state authority, or protecting civilians and upholding the values that are enshrined in our, in our mandates, um, none of that can really be done without the consent and cooperation of, of the host state. Um, and so working on that consent, which is dynamic, which ebbs and flows, as Nami was suggesting you know, in, in response to political developments, in response to the evolving interests of the actors on the ground, is an absolutely critical component of, of, of successful peacekeeping. I'd also like to I mean, introduce another notion in that, you know, having worked on, on the Capstone Doctrine back in 2008, this is something that I think many of us found needed to also be brought into the equation, which was the question of legitimacy, and legitimacy not in the legal sense, um, you know, there's an assumption that peacekeeping operations are legitimate by dent of the fact that they're a creation of the of the Security Council, but the legitimacy, the functional legitimacy, if you will, that comes from being able to and being perceived to meet uh, uh, the needs of stakeholders on the ground. Uh, and here is where I think the people-centered aspect of this comes in um, and where, um, you know, modern multidimensional peacekeeping has become very much a game of trying to reconcile sometimes competing expectations but that don't need to be the legitimate expectations of populations to be protected by their state to receive basic services um, to provide the protective environment that will allow them um, to to fulfill you know their basic needs and, and aspirations and increasingly peacekeeping operations are held to account by that standard by the very populations themselves whether we take a state-centric approach or not. And some of the problems we've encountered um, recently, and I, and I think of the example of you know, the crisis we faced in Northeastern Congo in the Beni area um, at the end of last year, where frustration over the perceived inability um, of both the mission and to some extent the national security sources to protect the population from 
from the threat of attacks by by the ADF, which is the main armed group in that area, um, really then boiled over into attacks on on the mission it, it itself. And so I think you know, as you were saying at the outset, and as Elizabeth was saying, um, we do need to get beyond this state centric approach and look at how we can find a way to build common ground uh, um, amongst these various constituencies and in a sense forge a consensus on how you move societies towards a, a, a situation where, where that protective environment for civilians is being created. And I think one of the biggest lessons um, coming out of the DRC experience, but I would say it's um, you know, certainly applicable to other contexts, is that you know these dilemmas and these problems can't be resolved through the use of force alone um, and i think one of the um, interesting trends you were talking about trends patrick at, at the beginning uh, of your presentation is that increasingly the success or failure of peacekeeping operations or their effectiveness is being viewed through the lens of their willingness to use force and whether or not they apply force either against non-state actors or state actors that are posing a threat to civilians, and I and I really do think that you know the the experience of, of recent years and decades has shown that while force may be part of the equation, it's certainly not the the solution, and certainly not uh, when force is applied in the absence of a broader political strategy, a broader political understanding uh, of the objectives that a mission is trying to achieve in partnership with with the state and in part of partnership with with um, with the broader set of actors. Um, who, who have a stake in the success of the mission. Uh, uh, and so, you know, the, that whole issue around the use of force, I think, needs to be looked at very, very carefully. Um, and really, I think, um, helps frame some of the sort of practical, if you will, tools that have been developed over the years to try and navigate and mitigate these tensions that you're that Patrick's report highlights I think, um, so so clearly. Um, you know, it be, it's become a truism, but dialogue and engagement at all levels ultimately um, is you know the, the the real sort of tool that we have at our disposal, the most effective, I would say, at our disposal as, as peacekeeping operations to try and and navigate these dilemmas. Um, if you look at the evolution of HRDDP to bring it now to a more sort of practical examples um you know hrddp was of course spearheaded in 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 the context of the drc and grew out of a conditionality policy that was first introduced as you rightly point out in, in your report patrick um which really sort of had a, a binary approach it was go no go based on a, a, a an assessment of whether or not the actors that the un was being asked to support and the state security forces were um you know uh, guilty of human rights violations or suspected of human rights violations. And over time, that policy framework has evolved into a, I would say, a much more pragmatic tool, which is really about using all the capacities at the disposal of the mission. Um, and this really goes to the heart of the notion that sort of protection of civilians needs to be a mission-wide, holistic uh, uh, undertaking to understand what the risks are, and put in place mitigating measures that allow that engagement to continue. Um, I think Elizabeth's absolutely right. It's not a, a, a perfect tool uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I think there are a number of challenges. Um, and I would refer um, colleagues to, to the report that just came out. I was actually reading it this morning by, by Civic, um, looking at the application of HRDDP in the MONUSCO context. And I think it really does capture some of the challenges related to first um, you know, sometimes the lack of understanding on the part of national counterparts, um, whether it's the security forces, whether it's the populations themselves, on what HRDDP is, is actually supposed to do. Um, misunderstanding sometimes within mission components, and I've, I'm sure Patrick, in, in the course of his research, had the same uh, reaction, countless um, discussions with, you know, force commanders, who express frustration over the fact that, you know, these human rights people are trying to tie my hands. I need to work with the security forces to affect, uh, to, you know, protect civilians effectively and so on. Um, and, and, you know, these are, these are being worked out um, and not to mention also the, the resource constraints, um, particularly when you're talking about uh, missions that are deployed in, in huge 
countries like the DRC or CR where you know resources are always going to be an issue. So I mean the tool needs to be perfected. Um, it, it, it's not the the be all and the end all, but I think it is an important sort of window into how over time um, the the approach has has evolved. Uh, and that engagement really um, is the is the default setting as opposed to go no go. Um, you know, I can cite other examples. I mean, like CAR, I think, uh, and these are under underscored in the in the report. Um, the mission's human rights engagement, the mission's engagement on justice. I think in very specific areas, whether it's um, um, whether it's um, dealing with child protection issues, um, sexual violence. Uh, there's been um, important progress that's been made. And a lot of that progress, and this brings me sort of to my, to my final point, has, um, can be boiled down into a notion that I think is often um, underestimated, um, which is the good offices of the mission, that through engagement with leadership at all levels, from the very highest levels to the provincial level, whether it's with the PNC, with it, whether it's with the FARDC, or even with uh, communities, that engagement uh, has has proven more effective, I think, including at the height of tensions um, in in the 2016-18 period, for example, when UNESCO was facing serious pushback from the authorities uh, because of the political context, helped to de-escalate tensions, helped to ensure that there was an open line of communication uh, 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 at all points that enabled to sort of that enabled the mission to to create that that protective environment. And so I think, um, you know, in going forward, we should be looking at how to strengthen those aspects uh, of what multidimensional peacekeeping operations do, and particularly communication. Uh, I know I'm running out of time, but I think this was perhaps one aspect of the report where I would have liked to have seen more about what can be done um, by missions at all levels to better communicate with the range of stakeholders uh, uh, that need to be catered to on the purpose of the mission, its objectives, and why not to lay out these dilemmas, which I think we sometimes underestimate the capacity of, of, of host populations to understand the complexity of what we do. And I think it would put us in better stead in achieving our objectives if we were able to communicate some of these dilemmas more clearly. So I'll stop there and uh, looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Um, thanks for reminding us that, yes, it, it's not only about the use of force. Uh, protection of civilians is actually encompassing a lot of different tools and approaches, including dialogue and engagement. And I think it's particularly important what you said about, it's not a binary approach. It's not about like, we support the host state, we don't support the host state. It's actually a very more nuanced uh, question. And uh, Patrick, I think you, you uh, mentioned in your report how we also need to disaggregate what host state means and um, by host state, the, like host states actually include a wide range of different actors, different interests. I think it's important to use all the levels of the missions to um, uh, influence the host state in, in supporting the host state to promote uh, a protective environment. And, uh, and that leads me to actually uh, uh, um, uh, our representative from, from Sudan, uh, Ama, Actually, the transitional government of Sudan has been strengthening its engagement with UNAMID as the mission is preparing its transition and eventual drawdown. And um, a new political mission is now going to be deployed to assist the government across a range of political and peace building issues, including civilian protection. So maybe building on the experience of UNAMID, can you share your views from a host state perspective on the challenges that we face today and possible ways forward to have peace operations and host states working together to build a protective environment. Thank you, Anna. Uh, allow me, as I would say, uh, you know, uh, to thank the International Peace Institute and the permanent mission of the Netherlands to the United Nations for inviting us to this webinar. Uh, I would like also to thank Mr. Labuda for producing this timely and informative policy paper. Uh, it is such an honor and, and privilege for me personally to be part of uh, this distinguished panel to touch base on this uh, significant topic. Uh, for the sake of time allotted for me, let me highlight some key elements and remarks. Uh, 
Uh, these remarks would be limited to UNAMIT in Darfur, as it is a mission that I am more familiar with. UNAMIT is quite an interesting peacekeeping mission in many ways. First, you know, it is uh, uh, at it is peak of uh, troops and police ceiling. It was considered to be the largest uh, UN peacekeeping of operation ever. And second, the mission was also unique in terms of uh, 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 the command structure with hybrid African Union United Nations United Nations composition. A third, the mission was also uh, interesting because of it is because it was uh, because of it is the area of its operation. You know because UNAMID is also unprecedented uh, because it was mandated to cover the whole region of Darfur, which is the size of France. In addition to that also, uh, UNAMIT used to operate in a complex security situation. When the mission was deployed, actually there was no peace. Uh, uh, peace was not fully restored, you know, in, in Darfur. Uh, so the mission was mandated, uh, you know, to operate in uh, an area where a peace has not been effectively uh, restored for the mission to keep. So when we look at the different cases of peacekeeping operations and missions, um, there is no one size fits all. These missions are deployed in different political and security situations. And because of that, any mission would ultimately, you know, um, has its own experiences, strengths, and weaknesses. And in my opinion, uh, two elements are quite significant in determining the success and failure of a peacekeeping operation. The ability and the willingness of the national authorities to cooperate with the mission and the capacity of the local institutions to produce uh, and provide protection uh, to the uh, civilians. Uh, when UNAMIT started to operate in Darfur, uh, its relationship with the government of Bashir was not an ideal one. Uh, let us not forget that UNAMIT was born after an extensive discussion following Bashir's stance towards Security Council Resolution 1701. Here, I would like to emphasize the role of the government consent in making any peacekeeping operation successful. Uh, resolution 1706 had failed because the government was uh, not engaged. And as a result of that lack of consent and engagement with the national government, the resolution is considered among one of the 10 worst Security Council resolutions ever according to the Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, I would like to commend the job that is done by the author of, the, of this, policy, uh, this policy paper in analyzing the element of consent uh, in his uh, uh, very impressive uh, paper. It is to be recalled that, you know, uh, Security Council resolutions which authorize peacekeeping missions always give the primary responsibility of protection of civilians to the national governments. Now, once a peacekeeping mission starts to operate, it might be recommended to begin by having a dialogue with the national authorities and support the host government and local communities. To be clear, whatever the strength of a peacekeeping mission, it, uh, its role remains secondary to that of the government. The dialogue with the national government uh, should have two objectives. One, assist the government to develop and implement, and implement a strategy of uh, civilian protection. And two, building the capacity of the law enforcement bodies to be equipped with the international standards and best practices. In some contexts, such as Darfur, one of the most effective law enforcement institution is the transitional, I mean, the traditional mechanism of crime control and punishment. This mechanism should be promoted, taken into account, uh, and, and taken into account when designing a peacekeeping plan for a protection of civilians. As mentioned in the policy paper, UNAMIT has started recently to engage with the national authorities uh, to enhance the protection of civilian programs and build the capacity of the local institutions. This approach turned out to be quite successful as reflected in the establishment of the state liaison functions in Darfur. The state liaison functions 
brings together UNAMID, the United Nations country team, as well as the government counterparts to enable joint program, uh, pro, uh, programs and activities aimed at advancing three transitional priorities in order to prevent a relapse into conflict. Namely, rule of law, and that includes police, justice, and corrections, durable uh, solutions for the uh, displaced population and host communities, and human rights and capacity building. Against the backdrop of this positive uh, change uh, brought to Sudan by uh, the December 2018 uh, uh, revolution, uh, Sudan has recently developed a national plan for protection of civilians in Darfur. The plan was shared with the Security Council a couple of weeks ago. And as a new uh, special political mission will take over while UNAMID is exiting, it would be helpful, helpful for the new mission to enhance the positive gains that have been achieved through the partnership between national institutions in Sudan and UNAMID. Uh, thank you, Nami, uh, again, and I look forward to the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amar. Um, I think, indeed, as, as you highlighted, uh, the relationship between a host state and a peacekeeping mission can also change over time. And the UN's capacity to adapt its, its leverage, uh, to, to adapt its, its uh, tools to leverage uh, potential cooperation is important. And I think the implementation, the development and implementation of a national protection of civilian plan, a robust national protection of civilian plan can be a key component in, in peacekeeping transitions and, and represent a significant tool to signal national ownership for protection of civilians and should certainly be uh, supported by UN peacekeeping missions. So maybe with that, uh, I'll turn to Aditi. Um, Aditi Patrick's paper offers a series of recommendations on navigating uh, host state dynamics while implementing POC such as leveraging um, leadership, coordinating pressure tactics, uh, using the full spectrum of bargaining tools and provi provide coherent messaging on the use of force, among others. So maybe in your perspective, uh, what are the concrete steps that a mission can take to de-escalate tensions and confrontational dynamics with a host state and to leverage its tools to maximize cooperation for POC? What also should be the role of not only the mission, but other actors to support uh, this kind of cooperation, like the Secretariat, the Security Council, and others. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nami, and thank and congratulations to Patrick uh, on on a paper on such an important topic. Um, you know, I think that Patrick, uh, Lisbeth, and Ugo have all talked about how POC and host state support don't always have to be in conflict. But of course, we know that unfortunately, in, in at times, in some some of the most major recent missions, they have been. Um, you know, in Darfur, in South Sudan, in DRC, in Cote d'Ivoire, and so many more missions, um, peacekeeping missions have really struggled to maintain the consent of the host state while also implementing POC mandates. So I wanted to focus my remarks on those thorny situations um, when POC and host state consent really are, uh, uh, when missions are struggling to do both. Um, and what, what uh, uh, peacekeeping stakeholders can do to navigate consent in those challenging environments. I wanted to start first just by summarizing some of Stimson's analysis on this issue. Nami mentioned at the start that we produced a paper in 2018 on host state consent. Um, and uh, one of the things that we had found when we began our research is that people use this phrase host state consent to mean all kinds of different things. So I just wanted to kind of uh, share our definition that we came up with as a sort of starting point for the discussion to have a common vocabulary. Um, we defined consent at its fullest, you know, in the most uh, in the most ideal situation as consisting of three elements. That's acceptance of the mission's presence on the ground, acceptance of the mission's mandate, and acceptance of the political process that the mission is mandated to support. Um, and we came up with a typology. So we said that if all three of those elements are present, we would call that strong consent. Um, if the government accepts the mission's presence on the ground, but its support for the mission's mandate or the political process is more questionable, then we call that weak consent. And if the government is not even consistently clear about wanting the mission to be on the ground, then we call that compromised consent. Um, and I'll, I'll turn to why we came up with that typology in a minute, but just to deal with uh, this, the question that Nami asked, which is what are the strategies for managing consent? 
In our report, we try to look at that question at three moments in time because we think there are different actions that are possible at different moments. So there's the phase before a, a new peacekeeping mission is deployed. Um, there's the phase when the mission first arrives on the ground and is kind of um, setting itself up and establishing a relationship with the host government. And then there's the third phase, which is if and when host state consent does start to deteriorate, when it starts to become like it, it becomes something uh, approaching a crisis. Um, so I'm going to try and lay out really quickly um, some strategies that missions and other stakeholders can use at each of those moments. But uh, I'd say that my uh, the strategies, the, the solutions I'm proposing here kind of have three themes to them. One is that what other speakers have already mentioned, that host state consent rises and falls over time. It's constantly in flux. And so it's not a it's not a one off issue that host state consent uh, takes active daily work to maintain. Um, the second theme is that missions can't navigate these challenges on their own. They really require active support from the Council and other member states and the Secretariat, especially if content does start to deteriorate. And the third theme is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of the cure. Um, there are so many more actions that a mission and other stakeholders can take before we reach the crisis point on consent. Uh, once we do reach that crisis point on consent, uh, options become much more limited. So, um, it's something that we really need to be on our guard for uh, from the start. So let me start quickly with the, uh, the period before the mission deploys. I think there are a lot of steps that the Council and the Secretariat can take here. First, to ensure that the Council really understands um, is setting itself up to stay politically engaged in supporting the mission uh, through its deployment. So uh, before authorizing a new peacekeeping mission, I think one simple thing the Council could do is to conduct a, a visit to the host country to meet with not just the government, but all the parties to the conflict and really understand the political dynamics at play and the political support it's going to need to provide to the mission. And the secretary can also assist the council here by generating analysis about the strength of host state consent um, and the consent of the other parties to the conflict to inform council negotiations before a new mission is authorized. And in terms of reducing misunderstandings, because our research found that uh, far too often uh, consent deteriorated because of simple misunderstandings between the mission and the host government about what the mission was allowed to do and, and um, was planning to do. So and to reduce misunderstandings at that stage, I think before the mission is deployed, the council can uh, sign a compact with the government that lays out a shared political vision and sort of details the roles and responsibilities of the mission and the government so that it's kind of clear from the start, um, the government's expectations for the mission and the mission's expectations are aligned. Um, so second, there's the period after the mission first arrives on the ground. Here, I think um, the mission can sort of uh, just take an early stance by being aware of the likely triggers for the deterioration of host state consent. In our report, we tried to find, we tried to identify some common triggers um, for what, what leads, you know, often, uh, often consent might be really strong at the start of a mission's deployment that can deteriorate over time. And so looking out for the sensitive activities that might lead to that deterioration, and those can include POC or human rights activities that are critical of the government. Um, elections are a common trigger for the deterioration of consent. Um, and then there's a range of activities that, that governments often perceive, perceive as threatening their sovereignty and especially to do with um, issues like security sector reform. So being aware of the actions that they might take that might trigger that deterioration. Um, and then to try and choose activities strategically based on the strength of consent. So if you are a mission uh, that's going in with strong host state consent, maybe you strategically choose to engage on some of the issues that are more sensitive on POC and human rights on um, to try and take advantage of that strong, the window of strong consent at the beginning. Um, on the other hand, if you're a mission that's going in with weak or compromised consent, maybe you start out with uh, some areas where it, it helps the government see that, that you do have some shared objectives, that there are things a mission can do that are actually beneficial to the government and start with those issues instead. So trying to be a little bit strategic at the start of the deployment. Um, missions can monitor consent regularly to identify signs of deterioration and pat patterns of obstruction. Um, it can document SOFA violations and report those violations to the Secretariat on a regular basis. Um, it can set up coordination structures with the government with government officials to minimize misunderstandings and just kind of be on the alert and respond firmly to early signs that that consent might be deteriorating to try and establish a strong stance at the start that um, that the mission has certain rights um, and, and you know will will enforce them. Um, 
And then finally, there's that question, the, the most difficult question, which is what happens if consent does start to deteriorate? What can, what can all these stakeholders do? So um, here, I think missions can strengthen uh, their engagement and place greater emphasis on securing the consent of people other than the head of state. I think um, other speakers have mentioned this, that you know, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the consent of the host government. And there, we, in a lot of missions, we actually just mean uh, the one individual, the head of state. Um, other speakers have talked about what we can do to kind of shore up consent of the population, but also other stakeholders, the legislature, opposition parties, trying to make sure that it's not just kind of one individual that's determining whether the mission stays or leaves. Um, missions can sensitize their counterparts about what their rights are per the SOFA and per their mandate. Um, so again, it's not just the government leadership, but also key individuals in the legislature, you know, uh, individual police officers and military advisors can engage with their counterparts in the security services. The justice and correction sections can engage with the, ju the judiciary. So trying to make sure that uh, all the parts of the government um, and uh, other parts of the state are aware of uh, what the SOFA is and uh, you know, making sure that the mission is, is not kind of encountering SOFA violations due to misunderstandings. Um, but you know, of course, that you know, in a crisis moment, the mission can't be acting on its own. You know, there's a limit at that point. The host governments know that they have this ultimate trump card of being able to expel peacekeeping missions if they if they want to. And so, missions at that point, when it reaches a real crisis, have limited options. They really need the secretariat and the council to step in. So, at these real crisis moments, I think we can make better use of council visits, visits of the secretary general. You know, holding open debates at the council. Um, and really using council diplomacy to ensure that influential regional powers, neighboring states are sending a coordinated message. Um, individual member states could consider sanctions or other bilateral diplomatic actions to try and put pressure on the state. So for example, the US government did this uh, in the DRC uh, to put pressure on family members and business associates of Joseph Kabila to ensure that elections would take place. Um, I think just to close on one final comment, in, in those really difficult situations, uh, the situations of compromised consent. The mission can become really um, stuck, really, really caught in a difficult place between wanting to stay and deliver on its mandate and pr protect civilians where they can, and on the other hand, becoming concerned about um, you know, being expelled from the country, trying to do what they can to, to stay in the country. So um, and I think that that can sometimes put missions in a really, um, in a really tricky spot and sometimes in a very dangerous position. So the, the really dangerous um, uh, situation that we want to try and prevent arising is situations where uh, missions are unintentionally bolstering uh, an autocratic or predatory state. Um, so if they are prevented by the state from actually implementing their POC mandates and holding the state to account for abuses, but they are still staying and they're trying to appease the government by carrying out tasks that are actually beneficial or convenient for the state, then they are kind of in effect um, acting as a service to the state while not holding the state responsible for POC violations. And I think that can be a really, really difficult situation to avoid, um, but a really dangerous one, a really dangerous position for the UN to be in. And that's kind of the worst case scenario that we want to try and avoid here when we talk about navigating POC and host state consent. So let me stop there. I look forward to the Q&A and thank you again for the opportunity to participate. Thank you so much, Aditi. Uh, thanks for this, this typology of, of consent and the different situations in which peacekeeping missions can be regarding host state relations and your concrete recommendations, especially in terms of analyzing what it needs, monitoring uh, the level of consent, identifying triggers that can deteriorate uh, the level of consent and the importance of external actors intervention, including the Secretariat and, and the Security Council. So, I think we, we have a lot that we have a lot to discuss, and I, I, I'm sure that the audience has uh, uh, many questions at this point. So I will now open the floor to the audience for questions to the panel. To ask a question, please type your question in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. I will make a selection of questions and read them to our panelists to answer to them live. And alternatively, participants can also use the raised hand function if you want to be given the floor and ask your question directly um, to our panelists via audio. Uh, I will ask you to be brief in that case to have the time for a dynamic conversation. We already have uh, a few questions. Uh, I have uh, Ian Anthony from CIPRI asking, how does a counterterrorism 
narrative impact the balance? Does it help? Does it hinder? Distract? Is it irrelevant? Does it make it irrelevant? Can you maybe share some views on, on uh, uh, environments where you have counterterrorism operations and uh, how it can impact these dynamics? Um, also, question on uh, a question on national POC plans that were already uh, mentioned. And that can serve as a way to promote national ownership and foster best practices for POC. The question is, how can UN peacekeeping operations work with host states to develop national POC plans? Could this potentially serve as a capacity building approach to strengthen POC, clarify roles and responsibility, and ensure POC's implementation uh, between uh, peacekeeping missions and host states? To what extent are local civil society organizations able to inform these national POC plans? Um, we also have a question on uh, human rights specifically. Uh, POC includes the monitoring of human rights uh, and reporting of human rights abuse, including those committed by state actors. What are reporting challenges that peacekeeping missions and human rights components face? And what are some best practices in this regard? Have UN human rights components been able to foster a productive dialogue with host states through their reporting? And do host states find this useful? Can it deter states from committing human rights violations and, and basically promote uh, uh, good practices there? So um, we, I, I think I'll turn to the panel now. Uh, if there are other questions, please send them now so that we can have time for a second round. Um, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll turn uh, to you, Patrick, if you want to start answering these questions. Uh, please, the floor is yours. You, yeah. yeah, so I mean, maybe I'll just take the, the question on human rights reporting, because I think that's a, a really interesting, um, it's an interesting question, sort of the overlap between uh, POC and human rights. And what I found uh, is that missions deal with this um, very differently. So, so it varies from mission to mission. Um, there are definitely challenges. Um, so all the missions um, where, so uh, again, the three missions that I uh, visited last summer are UNMIS, um, MINUSCO, and MINUSCO. And in these missions, um, UN staff were adamant that they do not um, compromise human rights. Um, so they report on human rights abuses when, when human rights abuses occur, even if the host state is responsible. Um, but but so it, generally speaking, that, that is uh, w what happens. But, but of course, there, there are def definitely challenges to reporting openly. And, and um, various UN officials did suggest that, um, that missions do sometimes tone down the language. They, they do not openly criticize the host government for fear of losing consent. Um, and the question then becomes, to what extent do these missions self-censor? Do they really strip um, a lot of information from, from reports or is it just maybe uh, things that are particularly, can potentially be um, um, particularly um, antagonizing for the host state? Um, what I will say about this though is that, um, That th this is this is certainly a problem. I think that this is this is really a problem in 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 in, in many peacekeeping uh, operations. But but of course, um, mission principles try to deal with this proactively, and there are best practices. Um, and one thing that that um, uh, UN officials pointed to is engaging with the host state proactively. So um, not blindsiding them with reports, putting them out, and you know the host state finding out almost after the fact that of course that this happened and we're accusing you of you know committing violations it's really about engaging a dialogue and this is not always possible right but trying to at least engage a dialogue with the host state letting them know these are our concerns what are your views on this so that you know these human rights reports can be um, um, an opportunity for engagement that doesn't mean, of course, that the host state is going to accept all the findings, but, but again, you, you can use this as leverage. Um, it's an opportunity to engage. Um, and I, I think in general, the human rights reports should be um, used more proactively also then to, to foster accountability. So you use these reports to engage with um, 
prosecution services in, 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 in host states so that you can target bad actors and, and that way potentially get the host state to, to recognize that there are individuals that, that are responsible. This, the, the host state does not want to be seen as supporting these individuals. So, so there are certainly ways in which um, um, uh, peacekeeping operations can navigate this tension and it's, it's just a question of, um, I think, engaging proactively on this. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Lisbeth, do, do you want to answer some questions? Sure, and thank you. Um, yes, thank you for all of those interesting interventions. And maybe, again, looking at the, the human rights uh, issue, I, I'd like to look at that and the POC. I think as an example um, of working in a state which has extreme limitations, uh, the other day I had a, an armed group text me that uh, a mil the, the military had just killed an 80-year-old Pell because he's Pell in an Arab neighborhood. And I forwarded the text to our force commander who said, can I forward this to the head of the army? I said, please. And that day, uh, the head of the army in this country actually had that soldier who pulled that trigger uh, detained. So I again stress that in a country where you're building up a, a military, where you're building an institution, your sort of front on engagement um, is very important uh, in looking at human rights violations. And I think for me, uh, human rights and POC, it's, it's one and the same. And that brings me to my second point uh, that often when we, the question referring to a national POC plan, well, I think that would be absolutely of high value in some countries. I also think that there are countries where too many plans for too many good things are just not reasonable. And we are highly compartmentalized. We have our gender strategy, we have our child protection strategy, we have our women protection strategy, we have human rights. We have, I'm in favor of POC, but I think we, we've got to be realistic uh, and really look at where we think we can have the greatest impact and work in a way with these governments that we don't just put consultants to do the work for them, meaning that ultimately nothing is sustainable, but that we look at real concrete ways of going back uh, to what I said earlier, working with watchdog groups, working with Inspection General, actually making sure that human rights violations are uh, reacted to and uh, abusers are brought before the law. With the, the counterterrorism, I, I leave someone when else on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisbeth. And, and I think it's important also in terms of national protection plans to avoid having just another output, another product, and, and, and uh, another technical exercise uh, when really what's important is, is to uh, promote a culture of protection and, and uh, um, incentivize real changes structurally with the whole state. So, uh, Hugo, may maybe you have some thoughts on this or maybe on, on the other points that were raised. Thanks, Nami. Can you hear me? No, I mean, just very quickly, I think the, the human rights point was covered just to say that certainly in, in the experience of MONUSCO, I, I think it has a, a long tradition of issuing um, public reports, sometimes on very uncomfortable issues. I mean, I again recall at the height of the tensions leading up to the 2018 elections, there was a public report that was issued on excessive use of force by state security uh agents uh, in dealing with a number of situations of urban unrest um and interestingly enough that report rather than eliciting you know what sometimes is viewed as the default setting you know we put out a report the government uh, takes exception that it was actually issued with an annex from the government itself i believe it was the ministry of, of human rights who had done its own investigation into those abuses and wanted to make sure that when the missions report came out, um, its own investigation uh, was was published alongside. And I think that's an excellent example of what you were saying and others were saying, Patrick, earlier, that it can't just, it, can't, it certainly can't be a confrontational um, approach. We need to find ways, I think, as you said in your report, to sort of work on the incentive structure that national actors are facing and make them sort of see it as being in their interests to promote a culture of protection and human rights. And I think how those reports were approached and certainly not blindsiding, but trying to uh, 
engage as much as possible um, is definitely the way to go. Um, and I think that extends to, to, the, to the idea also of national um, POC plans. I, I thought there was a very interesting passage in the report that said, you know, before, if we want to be effective on that, I think we also need to perhaps be a little clearer conceptually about what we mean. Um, and that, you know, rocking up to a ministry and saying, you know, let's get together and do a POC plan may not necessarily be the best way to go about it, that it really is, I think, having a, a, as granular an understanding of the, some of the underlying structural dynamics um, that sort of mitigate against the creation of, of a protective environment, whether it's, you know, structural deficiencies in the security forces that date back decades, if not generations, whether it's the local and regional dynamics in a particular area um, that are creating the sort of kinds of war economies that, that help certain types of behavior amongst the security forces and non-state actors perpetuate themselves to the detriment of, of, of civilian protection. Um, it, you know, the, it, it's a huge undertaking, and I don't think we should underestimate how difficult a challenge that is for you know, an external actor um, to to really get to grips with with some of these extremely complex dynamics, and you know, certainly the experience in in northeastern Congo with the sort of fight against the ADF um, has really shown, and, and and this has even been reflected in the budget, you know, the new budget for the mission, for example, that's under discussion now in the fifth committee, a realization that we need to beef up the ability of, of peacekeepers on the military side, on the police side, on the civilian side, to really have that sophisticated understanding of the, of the dynamics in order to be able to help come up with solutions that, that really speak to the situation on the ground as opposed to you know, templates that have been dreamt up, as Elizabeth was saying, that oftentimes are either unrealistic or don't really uh, uh, respond to, the, to, to what's actually going on on the ground. Um, you know, I would venture on the on the counterterrorism uh, uh, question. I, I think it's more of the same. I think um, you know certainly one finds situations where um, you know national authorities in particular will use or play the counterterrorism card or the terrorist card because they think it's in their political interest to do so because there are certain types of support that will flow from that whether it's financial or military um, and all in a quest to consolidate their authority um, uh, and um, you know i think again uh, one needs to be very um, sort of sophisticated and granular in the analysis of the dynamics at play to ensure that the that the UN isn't being instrumentalized, quite frankly, um, in um, in in what we've been saying throughout. That you know, as much as we need to work with host governments, um, ultimately our exit strategy depends, um, as the representative of the Sudan mission was saying, on our ability to build host nation and host state capacity to fulfill its core responsibility. We don't want to, we don't also want to play into dynamics that might in the long run sort of mitigate against that. So counterterrorism can be a double-edged sword in that regard. Thank you, Hugo. Um, Amar, maybe I'll, I'll give you the floor now uh, if she wants to answer uh, the question and in particular the one on uh, national protection strategies uh, because I think the, the experience of Sudan is very interesting in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Nami. And, uh, you know, the idea of developing uh, this national strategy came after the uh, uh, new transitional government took over. Uh, because uh, after the downfall of Bashir, uh, there is now a conducive environment in the country in order to address the root causes of the uh, security and political challenges that is uh, facing Sudan. So against this background, you know, the uh, government uh, has developed this national plan or nationalist strategy with the aim of uh, uh, promoting and protection, human rights and civilian protection in, in, in Darfur. Uh, the uh, strategy is a quite comprehensive one uh, because it was prepared uh, with a joint effort that bring together different 
uh, uh, national stakeholders. That includes uh, government institutions, uh, civil so society organizations, traditional leaders, uh, religious re leaders, and so on and so forth. So it is it is quite uh, uh, um, you know a holistic uh, strategy, and uh, the idea is that you know uh, with the uh, new government in Sudan the a political willingness of addressing the issue of protection of civilians in uh, Darfur and other areas uh, in Sudan, especially the two areas, the South Kordofan and, uh, and uh, Nile. Uh, the political willingness is now there, and unlike the situation before, you know. So uh, building on this uh, political willingness, I think it, uh, it would be better if also the international uh, partners, especially the United Nations, can help Sudan in uh, building the uh, capacity of the law enforcement agencies, you know, as well as the traditional uh, mechanisms that I, I mentioned before in my remarks. So I think uh, 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 by bringing uh, these elements together, uh, I think we are quite hopeful that, you know, uh, uh, um, the near future in Sudan will be totally different uh, than uh, we had before. And we are also quite optimistic that, you know, uh, one of the key mandates of the new uh, special political mission for Sudan is to assist and advise uh, and help, you know, the government in, uh, in, in enhancing, you know, the protection of uh, civilians especially in the affected areas. So I think uh, the political willingness is there. Um, uh, the uh, international uh, environment is also very conducive, you know, because uh, there is uh, a great willingness to support the transitional government in, uh, in Sudan from the different partners. As well as also, you know, uh, the local, the local uh, actors are, are also very much hopeful that, you know, uh, situations in Sudan are heading towards a positive development. So, yeah, that's what I can say for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And maybe Aditi, if you, if you want to complement uh, the views. Uh, I'll yield my time so we have time for a second round of questions. Great, thank you so much, Aditi. So uh, I think, well, we, we have a few minutes left and maybe as I'll give you the floor for concluding remarks uh, uh, to each of you. Uh, if you can also uh, include uh, elements of response for the other questions we received. There's one on uh, from, from Gay, uh, was on Bloom Kumar from Nonviolent Peace Force uh, on uh, complementing this, this discussion on UN mission and host state relations. And her question was about the complementary role and work of NGOs and INGOs in these situations. How do NGOs in the work of local communities complement or fill gaps in, in the mission performance and how can these relationships be enhanced to improve protection? Um, another question which is actually related and is also about uh, civil society is about this people-centered and holistic capacity building. Maybe concretely, what are ways in which Peacekeeping missions have established more direct lines with local civil society for POC strategies. How do we better ensure that missions and host states are accountable to local civilians? And how have missions contributed to building trust between civilians and, and host states and ensuring that host states respond to the needs of their population? So, uh, Aditi, if you maybe want to, uh, to respond to those now and also uh, uh, I, I ask you to be brief, uh, sorry about this, but if you can just take uh, one or a couple of minutes to answer and conclude, thanks. Okay, well, I'll just, um, I'll try and uh, cover a lot of ground by mentioning one theme, which I think is important for all of us to remember. When we look back at the capstone doctrine, it doesn't talk about host state consent. It talks about the consent of the parties to the conflict. And I think that's a theme that's come out of a lot of our discussions today, that the, the host state government, um, the executive branch of the host state government is only one of many parties that we need to be uh, reaching out to and engaging in dialogue and maintaining consent with. Um, and uh, I think that there's a reason why, you know, peacekeeping missions tend to focus on the head of state. That's because they have the legal authority to expel the mission from the country. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are the only um, party that the 
mission has the obligation uh, to work with, nor does it mean that they're the only party that the mission would be you know, strategically best placed to engage with. So um, I think that um, there's a lot there's a lot of detail we could go into. We don't have the time, but um, missions, I think, can and should do a lot more to make sure that they are focusing on the consent of a broader range of stakeholders and not just on the head of state. Thanks for this, Aditi. Um, Amar, maybe if you want to uh, also provide a concluding point at this moment, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think just to conclude, uh, for me, you know, for any uh, peacekeeping operation to be successful in uh, delivering its uh, mandate when it comes to the uh, uh, civilian protection, I think that lies uh, in uh, three uh, points. The first point is the host, host country consent and the second one is collaboration not confrontation with the local authorities and based, that's based on our experience and the third one is trying uh, to help uh, the national authorities to develop uh, a national plan or a st strategy because uh, according to the uh, experiences by other uh, you know peacekeeping operations you know when they start to operate in a country there there is no no national plan. The, the local government does not have a national plan, and uh, the uh, peacekeeping operation uh, operates, you know, uh, in isolation uh, from the uh, from the local authorities, and that can create, you know, a vacuum that is really can be, you know, gapped through collaboration, you know, between the local authorities and the peacekeeping mission. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Hugo, please. No, uh, thanks very much. I mean, it's, it's very interesting that the last couple of questions have taken us to, I think, what is, I don't know if one can call it the new or the final frontier in, in, in peacekeeping, but this notion of how do you actually put into effect the, the idea of people-centered peacekeeping? How do you um, bring civil society in, into the equation? Um, and yeah, I mean, I, just to quote a couple of sites, sorry, a couple of examples from MINUSCO. Um, I, I think, you know, over, over the years, the mission civil affairs section, for example, I think it's one of the biggest of any of our multidimensional peacekeeping operations has helped to build up uh, the sort of pretty vast network of community alert networks. Um, it hires community liaison advisors. And I think these are very much, apart from serving a very sort of practical function of, um, you know, alerting uh, early warning and response to POC threats, I think can certainly be seen as, as the building blocks of a sort of national and local capacity that should ideally outlive the presence of, of, of the mission. The question really here is sustainability. And I think this is where NGOs and other partners come in. I mean, how do you ensure that all these innovative tools and all these mechanisms that have been put in place uh, during a lifetime of the peacekeeping operation endure when it's gone. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, the idea that, we, that that needs to be rooted in some sort of broad vision going forward for how um, a society as a whole, you know, the state has its responsibilities, but citizens have their expectations and their responsibilities too. are going to work together to maintain that environment, um, taking advantage of the stabilizing trends. And so the mission is really, I think, the big challenge that we face, not just in peacekeeping, but um, as a UN system going forward. Um, so I look forward to Patrick's next report on that, um, on that particular set of issues. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Um, Lisbeth, please. Yes, and following um, in suit with what the others just said, I mean, just in, from my experience, what we're doing now here is really having inclusive committees that are follow-up follow up committees to the implementation of the peace accord. Um, in other places, I think it is highly political, but I do think that if the United Nations was to commit to looking at how we could connect uh, what ministries commit to do in an annual plan with civil society involvement, understanding budget parameters, what their goals are and having what we've done in the past, what I started to do in human rights in Haiti was have university um, settings where you would have those kinds of debates. What does the minister of justice 
proposed to do this year with regard to protecting civilians and making sure human rights are, um, are respected. And if you have that kind of political engagement, something that's sparked by the UN, I do think it has a chance of, of going forward um, in, in the long run. And I would like to just say that in my experience, it was very uh, helpful to work with mayors and local civil society groups to see how they feel, where do they want their communities to go? And this is about people really uh, taking responsibility for their future and us just sort of trying to spark that engagement over the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, Patrick, you have a last word. <laughs> you have a floor. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so just uh, very briefly also uh, sort of building on what, um, on uh, Ugo's comments, also responding a little bit to to the two questions about uh, sort of people-centered peacekeeping and, and POC. Um, you know, just to provide, again, these are very broad questions, so it's difficult to, to, to give a holistic response, but just to give a very sort of concrete example, again, uh, the DRC mission where you have the Comité de Suivi, so these monitoring committees uh, that bring together um, the military, the police, the mission, but also sometimes civil society. Uh, and this is a way to monitor allegations um, against members of the security forces. So there you have you know, the civil society directly contributing in that way, trying to sort of hold the state accountable. So this is, I think, an interesting example um, where you know all these these issues that we've been talking about uh, overlap and, and sort of feed into one another. Um, but of course, this is this is an example from Minusco, and so this is a sort of the, the the last thing that I want to say. Um, you know, th this is a question that I raised also in my comments. We're moving away from multi-dimensional peacekeeping. Increasingly, we are talking about peace operations with a with a light military police presence, maybe no police presence. For example, in Sudan, we see that this, this peace operation is, is, is not going to be able to implement these mechanisms. And um, the question then becomes, what is the role of POC in a mission like the new Sudanese mission? Um, I remember, um, I remember uh, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, so the head of peacekeeping saying last year that POC is inherent in peacekeeping. Uh, you know, pe this is just something that we do and it, it, it doesn't even have to be in the mandate. Uh, peace operations have this duty almost to, to do POC. And the question for me really going forward will be when we support host states, how do we reconcile again this idea of supporting host governments with this inherent concept of POC that has now taken hold at the UN. And I think that's going to be a real challenge going forward. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, well, um, I think today's discussion was uh, extremely valuable in exploring how we can uh, better articulate protection of civilians and host state support in, in peacekeeping. It's, it's an issue that is often considered as one of the most challenging ones uh, in peacekeeping operations. And I'm glad that we were able to compare different missions, different experiences, different contexts, outline potential best practices, and, and think creatively about um, what, in what way we can truly support protection as the primary responsibility of, of the host state. And I think putting national actors um, at the center is certainly key to, to, uh, to this and to ensure the sustainability of protection in the field. I think we also all agree that rather than perfecting their own internal systems and tools to protect civilians, peacekeeping missions have to engage and closely engage with national stakeholders to promote the development of national protective structures and accountability mechanisms. And it certainly means uh, engaging with host states, but also with host communities. And I think that's a topic that was raised several times in this discussion. Um, missions have also a role in acting as a bridge between the civilian population and, and government actors. And I think it, it, it's really key in the implementation of POC mandates. So I would like to thank and really congratulate Patrick for 
offering this timely, in-depth, and, and much-needed uh, analysis of protection challenges as they relate to host state support. Um, thanks to all the speakers today for a really fascinating and, and, and dynamic and frank discussion on, on this topic. Uh, thanks to the Netherlands for partnering with us. And thank you all for participating in this policy forum and follow, following us uh, online. Um, we will make the recording of this event available on the website of IPI, but the report is already available. So please don't hesitate to download it, to read it, and share it widely. Um, thank you again to everybody. Have a great day and uh, stay safe.